have Charles Papon, uh, Mr. Spinal himself, <laughs> with tile link inter interconnect generators. I'm quite yeah. interested. Yeah. Take it away, Charles. Over to you. Cool. Is this 20 minute talk? Ten, uh, no, no, it's 15. Oh, I 15 mean, and then five for Q&A. Yeah, I yeah. think so, yeah. Cool. All, right. All right, just checking. Cool. Thank you. So, hi. Uh, how do I go to say? Oh, okay. So, um, just tiling in short, very in one slide. Uh, so it's uh, free and open source uh, memory based specification. And if you want to compare it with EXI, in a few words, uh, from, from my opinion, I would say it's a memory based specification with much less feature creep than uh, EXI4. Um, it's much easier to meet all the requirements. You don't have to handle unaligned bus access. You don't have to um, handle sparse memory bus access. You don't have weird burst modes, like you don't have um, fixed uh, burst mode. You don't have wrap burst mode. And um, the bus is synced as a out of order memory bus. You can't enforce any ordering between transactions which are already in flight, which simplify a lot of things in the interconnect. And so there is mostly two modes you can use uh, tiling. Is you can use the simple mode where you have two stream, um, one to read write, to send requests, one to get responses. But if you go if you want to go in the memory coherent land, then you add three other channel basically to handle uh, probing uh, blocks out of the masters or to get ownership on some blocks. And so. The thing is, when you go in this kind of memory bus with memory currency, you start to have a lot of parameters flying around your wall SOC. You can handle them by hand, but it's really messy, dirty, and when you want to add a new peripheral, a new thing, a new SOC to modify it, it really becomes a mess really fast, get out of control. And so you kind of need some parameter propagation and negotiation. And to give some example of this, like uh, in EXI, you have the ID signals that most of the time were magically set to four bits on the master side and eight bits on the slave side. And in Tiling, you kind of have the same things. You have a source and sync signals, which are transaction uh, identifiers, which will expand through the interconnect, which may mutate through the interconnect. Uh, you also have uh, the simple address with and data with, which in many cases can just be inferred through your uh, SOC connections. Uh, memory region attribute, like for instance, if you have a CPU, he may want to know at elaboration time which portion of the memory is cacheable, which portion of the memory is for peripherals only, and all sorts of things where he can do speculative access. That's one thing we, can, we are kind of used to set statically or by hand can be inferred automatically at elaboration time, and a few other things. And so, to, to give some context, I stopped writing VHDL uh, in 2015, and since I'm in the hardware description library land, or others call it like HDL, uh, like Spinal HDL, uh, Chisel, Midgen, Amaranth HDL, that's a family of hardware description libraries, and the, the thing to understand with them is like they're embedded in a general purpose programming language and it's by executing regular software code and doing calls to a, a specific API, specific, li specific libraries, that you will explicitly add hardware element in a netlist that you are currently building. Like to give an example of code, very simple, like here is some Scala code when at Scala runtime, uh, so it will execute this first line. It will say, okay, I have A and B, and there will be uint 8-bit signals. I will add that to the netlist. And then he continue, okay, adding result to the netlist. And then here adding some combinatorial behavior to the netlist. Really in a sequential manner. That, that really is a paradigm. And so because now we want, would like some kind of parameter propagation and negotiation, we kind of need to break this down a bit. We need some ways to yeah, to propagate things in the, at, at elaboration time. And there is many ways to do that. I would say mostly here uh, three examples. You, you can go the software engineered way, uh, very much uh, software engineering where uh, if you want to add an agent 
like a CPU in your system, you will need your CPU uh, class at elaboration time to implement a software interface to receive callbacks from a centralized uh, elaboration time uh, scheduler, which will, for instance, ask the CPU at elaboration time, uh, what kind of memory abuse do you have? What are your requirements? And, and try to make everybody happy in the SOC. So that, that's one way to go, for instance. Uh, the, the elephant in the room is like rocket ship diplomacy for tiling. That's really one of the main projects around tiling. And basically, the way rocket ship diplomacy goes, uh, from my understanding, is they are mostly based on Scala lazy val uh, feature, which is um, a kind of fancy feature in Scala is that you can define an attribute. You can define how this attribute should be initialized, but that initialization will only be done at the moment it is required by other parts of the code. So it's kind of a delayed variable definitions. And through that, and some lambda functions, they propagate pr parameters through the wall design and negotiate things. Also, one thing about uh, rocket ship diplomacy, it is module-centric. That means the node, the primitive elements of your SOC from the, trizal, uh, the rocket ship diplomacy is the module itself. Like, if you have a bridge, it is a node. If you have a CPU, it is a node. If it's a peripheral, it is a node. While the final HDL implementation of the tiling interconnect is a, a bit the reverse. It's like a node is a memory bus instance. Like if, if you have a bridge, you will have two nodes, one for the upstream, one for the downstream. And it is based on fiber to propagate parameters around. And so when I say fiber, you can hear in your head um, user space elaboration time thread. So I will give some example. Some, some dummy example, uh, not fully representative, but just to get the concept around, to have some idea. Like, imagine you have, you, you, you have a peripheral, and you will elaborate the peripheral hardware in its own uh, fiber, so elaboration thread. And for instance, to elaborate the peripheral hardware, we will define our data signals, which will be our unsigned of data with bits. Thing is, data with bits is, will be, in this example, a parameter which will be propagated from another fiber. So data with is a handle, and if we access it, and it's not loaded with any value yet, this code will block the execution of this uh, fiber. And Another time, you will have another fiber like the CPU saying, oh yeah, by the way, data width will be 32. So it's kind of simple parameter propagation, simple example. Another example, um, like imagine you want to design a pipeline in a CPU. Thing is, pipelines are often shared between dif very different parts of the design. For instance, if you have a front end in a CPU, your front end will be shared, for instance, between the instruction decoder, between the register renaming units, maybe with the dispatcher unit, or some branch prediction correction units. And so basically, you have multiple pieces of hardware which will compose a pipeline. And so the way how it can be handled um, following this uh, paradigm is like, OK, let, let's define the elaboration of your hardware in a fiber, or of your pipeline in a fiber. But before letting it go too far, we will wait on a given lock. Like you can see that lock as a semaphore or like a mutex, something to block the execution of this elaboration time fiber. So like lock, okay, it is a lock, and here we retain it. And for instance, here you have the decoder logic which will tell the pipeline the requirement it has, like where he needs to read the program counter, where he needs to do this, that, that. And when the decoder elaboration time fiber is done, it will release the lock, which will let the pipeline elaboration go further, instantiate all the arbitration required to implement that, all the register to get the data through the stages, and so on. So that's the basic idea. And to go back to tiling, uh, the implementation in Spinal XDL, so the idea is that you have those nodes, 
uh, you can connect multiple master, multiple slave to each node. It will automatically propagate parameters through it may mutate the parameter through if required. It will add the required arbiter decoder to handle all those people. And uh, although, for instance, it, it will do some kind of adaptations, like if there is some like uh, 64 bits co bus connected to a 128, it will insert with adapter automatically. It will, it will try to keep things uh, f functional, uh, although it will handle cross clock domain automatically, all these sort of things. And then, okay, here, here is a, bi a bit of code. It's an example of a dual core, uh, NAC RISC V, with uh, memory current hub connected to a memory and some peripherals like a plic and a slint. And basically, this is enough to run Linux already. And here is the full code of the top level for this SOC. I, I will, yeah, go, just go fast through like here. We create a few uh, CPU instances. Here, we will configure them all with a cur memory current configuration with a given heart ID. Uh, and here, we create a cur memory current hub to solve all the currency issues to uh, go down to a simpler bus uh, interface. We connect the instruction bus and database of every CPU to the upside of the hub. And then, create a memory RAM. We will connect that RAM at a given address of a, a given memory range, and so on, and so on. And so th the thing is, here you can see a lot of things are not there, like uh, source and a sync signal with are automatically negotiated through all those schemes. Data width, the same, like the CPU here will propose a given data width to the interconnect. Some slaves may not agree, they may say, no, it's too big, I want 32 bits, and so on. Same for address width. And and yeah, so trying to keep the top level pretty clean. Um, here are instructing some peripherals, having a shared node, which, you, which is used as a shared bus, connecting the plics, the slints, binding all the CPUs on it, adding some uh, pipelining to keep the frequency high on the connections. And so, uh, yeah, just a few slides about the side project related to this work. There is Naxxus 5. Uh, which now can work in multicore with uh, Tiling, with this Tiling interconnect. That was a demo you have seen yesterday, running on the screen there, running Doom, with keyboard, mouse, all of this. So it is an out-of-order multi-issue risk v CPU core, which mostly target FPGA. Uh, so, okay, it, it's a big soft, soft core, a fat soft core, but for what it does, uh, it's quite small. If you, if you compare, if you look really what it is, it is quite small uh, and quite fast for the FPGA it is running in. can run Debian. Uh, it's 32-bit, 64-bit core. And it is plugin-based like VexRisk 5. But there is a few, a few tricks there. Like VexRisk 5 was plugin-based. That means the top level of Vex was just pipeline definition, and you fill all the ELU in with plugins. Here, uh, it's kind of the same, but uh, the pipelines that of, Na of NaxRisk 5 themselves are plugins. And those plugins are made of fiber instead of being made of callbacks. And last slide is about RVLS. So RVLS is a project I had to do because I didn't find any proper framework to do lockstep verification of uh, RISC-V simulation traces. Like, imagine you made a CPU. You want to check it's behaving well when you run it in simulation. Like, you boot Linux on it. You want to check that it does everything right. Currently, it's a bit a mess. You, you may have to use Pike manually and to bind it. It's not easy to do, and basically, AVLS tried to solve that. So it is a RISC-V simulation trace checker um, based on Spike to provide a RISC-V model. And basically, you run your simulation, you collect the traces of the execution, and you fit that into a VLS, it will tell you if yes or no there is issue or where there is issue. You can also uh, drive a VLS directly via C++ callback or Jenny. And it even supports a multi-core system. So you can boot dual core, RISC-V in simulation and have quite a lot of check done while simulation is running. And that's mostly, that's, that's it, yeah. So, yeah, 
if you're interested, there is an open discussion on uh, GitHub about those work, and uh, the SOC US thing run uh, is on Litex. There is a pending pull request opened. And L2 current cache is on the way. Probably in one month, it will be functional. And yep, that's it. Perfect timing. Perfect timing. Um, what, what's happening with tiling? Like, it's scary, yeah? I don't know. Well, you, actually, I actually genuinely don't follow it that closely at the moment. I was not following tiling closely. What I've seen is that if you ask questions about it, kind of nobody answered, or maybe people in the same situation as you answered. And as I can tell, my, 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 my view on it is seems like there is kind of a dead repository with a specification with no handling of it. It's floating, it's drifting around. So your question was, is tiling dead? No, no, no. <laughs> no like generally, what's the latest? There's late, uh, the latest tiling too, yeah. which uh, I don't know how uh, full uh, release there is draft, but uh, there will be a final specification of tiling too, which will have a new coherent and knock modes, whatever. But tiling one is as good as it is. It is. Uh, I mean, like you said, it's simpler than Maxi. Uh, why you need uh, uh, like recent releases, right? So if you have a problem with tiling uh, as is, yeah, so it's open source project, so go, go and uh, report it. Yeah, so a Chip Alliance uh, owns spec pack right now, so it's on GitHub and oh, tiling one. one, yes. And, and about tiling two, you were talking about. So tiling two is in draft mode right now. So once we have something, you know, in a, in in a, you know, we can release it to public without okay. uh, hurting kittens. We will. Our talks about it uh, in, I, I know in the Risk Five uh, private, um, hide, hidden, there is this uh, interconnect work group. Is Tiling 2 talked about in this interconnect work group? No. Okay. So, uh, you mean the Chip Alliance? Uh, which one? No, you, you know there is this Risk Five uh, mailing oh. list. Uh, interconnect work group, yeah. I, I think I it's a uh, more higher level working okay. group. May include CXL. Yeah, I mean, it's not not necessarily uh, tiling only. Okay. It may include uh, interoperability or something. I have a que uh, another question while I'm in transit. You know the arithmetic ops that tiling supports? Sorry? The arithmetic operations that you can do on destination memory. Doesn't Tiling have all these arithmetic operations? Oh, the atomic one, you mean? No, atomic, but also like add, you can do arithmetic operations on a destination thing. Isn't that in the Tiling spec? <laughs> yeah. There's, there's like a parameter or an opcode. Anyone know what I'm talking about? So, I don't, so computer and memory, is, so computer and memory is technically not part of interconnect. Yes, you can ask for it, but it has to be your protocol on top of Tiling. Yeah. But it's in the tile link spec, right? That you can do this. There's like these opera, isn't it? The only thing I can think about is atomic operation. Yeah. Uh, but I, I have to say, I, I, I have a hard time reading a spec. I'm mostly <laughs> jumping through. I may um, have missed some information. I've about never it. seen a spec that's easy to read, frankly. But um, uh, okay, I, I'll move over here. Anyway, I'll catch up with you later. Maybe yeah. I'm hallucinating? I don't know. But anyway, they seem like a good idea, right? Because if I want to update a register in memory, I've got to like read the bloody thing and modify it. It'd be good if I could just do like an or and send it over the bus and be done with it, right? Anyway, I thought that was hey, the are thing. You done Julius? Hmm? Are you done with your brand? <laughs> I'm, I'm walking. I'm walking. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I have a question now. Uh, so when you get this uh, integrated with Litex, right, how do I see the performance improvement, will I have a higher core mark uh, than the normal Wets uh, 5 that Litex support? Or the area, would be, what, what would be the benefit that somebody can
can see now with this tiling approach for a user, let's say, not a developer. So you're asking mainly about the interconnect side of things? Yeah, so what will be the overall core mark score will increase or not when I have this new processor, let's say. Uh, or on the FPGA, what would be the final difference? What would be the KPI by which I measure uh, uh, this approach, this styling approach? Ah, this styling approach to negotiate yeah, parameters yeah. around. Ah, yeah, okay, okay, this okay. This is okay. my question. So compared to to what? Compared? Compared to what today Litex is doing, right? Ah, okay. So Litex does not do much parameter uh, propagation negotiation. It's kind of a fixed scheme. Yeah. Um, I mean, like in Tiny, there is kind of a lot of things we can move around. Uh, but it's a bit like with the EXI. Um, so I would say with this approach. Is it a cleaner approach and uh, let's say uh, performance wise or you know there's no other benefit then it's just a cleaner approach I would say it mostly focused on being a cleaner approach also um, I, I don't I, I don't know if I, what I say is fully accurate because I don't know much about the inner uh, guts of, of, of Litex uh, I would say with this approach you can go as much deep as you want it's not one shared central bus like the, the, the um, um, design space is really large and very flexible. That, that may be the thing, like because here we don't have a centralized scheduler which has to restrict the scope to, to work. Here it's really flexible in the way you can elaborate the interconnect. But I may be wrong about it. Okay. Yeah. That's probably it. Okay. Thank you, Charles. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Yeah.